In this lesson, we're going to talk about probably one of the more unfamiliar aspects of the executive assessment for most students when they start out their study, which is exponents and radicals. Now, the reason that this is unfamiliar is just you probably don't use this notation all that frequently any longer. So let's first just define how exponential notation works. When you have exponential notation, you have two parts. You've got your base, which is the big number, and your exponent, which is your small number that kind of goes up and to the right of said base. And the way the notation works is that your base is your numeric value. It's whatever the integer in most cases, not always, but in most cases, that is being then raised to some exponent. And the exponent is the number of times that numeric value is multiplied by itself. So for instance, two to the fourth power means two times itself four times. So two times two times two times two, which is 16, because two times two is four, four times two is eight, and eight times two is 16. And only a negative base raised to an odd power can produce a value less than zero. So what that means is when I do negative two squared, which is to the second power, I'm doing negative two times negative two, and those negatives cancel. So negative two times negative two becomes positive four again. But if I did negative two to the third power, then I have negative two times negative two, which becomes positive four because the negatives cancel out. But then that positive four times another negative goes back to being negative and becomes negative eight. So this is just one of those rules that the exam, again, in harder, usually second half um, quantitative questions on the executive assessment can exploit as a concept. So now let's talk about radical notation. So the X is what is known as the radicand. So that's the part that is being rooted in most common vernacular. And the Y is the degree. Now, if there is no degree, then you have a square root. So the radicand is always going to be a numeric value. And the degree is the number of times that root value is multiplied by itself to produce the radicand. So the cube root of 64 would be equal to 4, because 4 times 4 times 4, so 3 4s multiplied together, is 64, and we're taking one of those three equal radicands. And you cannot square root a value less than 0 on this exam, because that becomes a non-real number. And we've talked about in other lessons how the exam is only concerned with real number values. And if you square root a negative, say negative 1 or any negative value, you get is what is known as the imaginary number. And that's because we know that you can't get a negative value by multiplying something by itself, because if you multiply a negative by a negative, it becomes positive. You multiply a positive times a positive, you get a positive. So you'd have to multiply two values that are different to get a negative, and that's just not allowed for the executive assessment. And as I mentioned to start this, if you don't have a degree outside of your, square, your radical symbol, that means you are square rooting, which means you are splitting the radicand into its two equal factors and taking one of them only. So let's go back to our exponential notation. And there are just some less familiar exponents that we need to cover. So starting with what four to the one half power means, that is the square root using exponential notation. And the reason for that is we're taking half of the equivalent factors of four because four can be split into two equivalent factors of two. And so if you see four to the one half power, that's the same as the square root of four, which is just two. Now, a negative exponent does not impact the sign of the base. And this is very important because oftentimes folks will see a negative exponent and think that that makes your base negative. If your base is not originally negative, you do not get a negative by way of an exponent ever. But what a negative exponent means is you're actually taking the reciprocal of the base and then applying the, uh, the uh, exponent's value as a positive exponent. So four to the negative second power, you've got to take the reciprocal of four, which is one fourth, and then you apply that second power. So I multiply one by itself and I keep one. And then I multiply four by itself and get 16. So I know that four to the negative two power is in fact one sixteenth. And there's one last unique power that we got to think about, which is to the zero power. The proof for why four to the zero is going to be one is seen in the fraction there because four to the fourth power divided by four to the fourth power 
is one. And that means that I have no fours left over. And if I remove all the factors of any other value, I'm left with one no matter what. So anything raised to the zero power is always going to be one. Now, let's talk about manipulating exponents when you have the same basis. So this is only going to work if you have the same big number. And if you multiply the bases, you simply add the exponents. So 4 to the 3rd times 4 to the 4th is just 4 to the 7th. If you're dividing your bases, all you have to do is subtract the exponents. So 4 to the 4th divided by 4 to the 3rd is going to be 4 to the 1st, or just 4, because every integer without an exponent implicitly has an exponent of 1. Just in the same way that every integer implicitly has a denominator of 1. And if you raise a base to a new power, you have to multiply the exponent. So for instance, if I had 4 to the 4th raised to the 2nd power, I really have 4 to the 8th power. But if you are adding or subtracting like bases, you must factor before you begin combining those exponents. So if I had, for instance, 4 to the 2nd plus 4 to the 2nd plus 4 to the 2nd plus 4 to the 2nd, that is not going to be 4 to the 8th. Because 4 to the 8th would be 4 to the 2nd times 4 to the 2nd times 4 to the 2nd times 4 to the 2nd. So what do we do? What can we do? We factor a 4 to the 2nd out of each of those 4 to the 2nd terms. So we are left with 4 to the 2nd times 1 to get the first 4 to the 2nd, plus 1 to get the second 4 to the 2nd, plus 1 to get the third 4 to the 2nd, and plus 1 to get the fourth 4 to the 2nd. And it just so happens when we sum those four ones, we get 4. So we've got 4 to the 2nd times 4 which becomes 4 to the 3rd because 4 to the 2nd times 4 means we add the implicit 1 exponent to the 2nd exponent, and we get 4 to the 3rd, or 4 cubed, and then we have 4 times 4 times 4 is 64, which is the result of 4 squared plus 4 squared plus 4 squared plus 4 squared using the exponential notation. Now, if you have the same exponent, you can also manipulate your expressions. And if you have the same exponent, you can multiply the bases as normal. So if we had 2 squared times 5 squared, that is just 10 squared. We keep the constant exponent. And we see that proven out by just doing 2 squared is 4, 5 squared is 25, and 4 times 5 is 100. And of course, 100 is 10 squared. So you can maintain your exponential notation if the exponents themselves are constant by just combining the bases through multiplication. Similarly, you can divide the bases as normal. So if I had 6 squared divided by 3 squared, that's just equal to 2 squared. And again, sure enough, we prove it out. We've got 6 squared becomes 36, 3 squared becomes 9, and 2 squared becomes 4. And indeed, 36 divided by 9 is, of course, 4. You can even factor your bases as normal. So if we've got 8 squared plus 6 squared, that's equal to 64 plus 36, which is 100. But if we wanted to do it exponentially, I can factor 2 squared out of both 8 squared and 6 squared. So 2 squared times 4 squared would become 8 squared. 2 squared times 3 squared would become 6 squared. And we can see by distribution that 4 times 16, which is 4 squared, plus 9, which is 3 squared, gives us 4 times 25, which once again is 100. And this is just to show you the flexibility and honestly this the kind of craft that is involved with the exponential notation that we use. So this is how you can manipulate exponent exponential expressions when the exponents themselves are constant, but the bases aren't necessarily so. Now, with radicals, you can do the same thing. And you can multiply the radicands as normal as long as you have the same square root. So if I've got the square root of 16 times the square root of 9, that's equal to the square root of 16 times 9. And I know that 16 times 9 is just equal to 16 times 10 minus 16 times 1, which is 160 minus 16, 144. And the square root of 144 just so happens to be 12. And if you just did all of the math easy, more easily by taking the square roots at the start, you find that 4 times 3 is also equal to 12. Because, of course, the square root of 144 is 12 too. You can also divide your radicands as normal. So if I have the square root of 144 divided by the square root of 36, that's just the square root of 4. And again, I can prove this out by just taking the square roots first. So the square root of 144 is 12, the square root of 36 is 6, and the square root of 4 is 2. And indeed, 12 divided by 6 is equal to 2. And of course, the square root of 4 was 2 to start. We can even do this with 
non-perfect squares. And this is very much the kind of thing that you might see on the executive assessment, where they just want to test your ability to understand the mechanisms of this manipulation. So if I've got the square root of 80 divided by the square root of 5, there is no perfect square root of 80. There is no perfect square root of 5. So you might immediately go, how am I supposed to solve for this? But if I divide 80 by 5 and keep that square root symbol, well, 5 goes into 8 one time. We subtract out the 5 from 8. We get 3 if we're doing the long division. And 5 goes into 36 times. And the square root of 16 just happens to be 4. And the way that you need to consider radicals is just that they are half of the stuff that makes up whatever number uh, they have under the, uh, the radical sign on its own. And if we had the other half, we'd magically get them to match up exactly. So I've got half of the stuff of an 80 divided by half of the stuff of a 5, which logically makes sense. I'd have half of the stuff that makes up a 16. But it just so happens that that's a perfect square because half of the stuff, the equivalent factors of 16 is 4, and that's how this can translate into an integer. And you can factor your perfect squares to simplify as well. So if we had, say, the square root of 72, we can simplify that by knowing that the square root of 72 is just the square root of 36 times 2 all underneath the radical. And you can pull out any perfect square. So the square root of 36 becomes 6, and the square root of 2, because it's not a perfect square, has to remain under the radical uh, symbol. So we know that the square root of 72 can be simplified down to 6 square roots of 2. So now that we understand the basics of how exponential and square root or radical notation work, let's go on over to the whiteboard and see some examples to put all of this into motion. So as with all problem solving questions, I'm going to write out my answer choices A through E, put a little line over top for what we're being asked for. But in this case, the entire thing is what we're being asked for. So I don't need to write anything special down to keep track of the sought value. But I do note that I've got real numbers in our answer choices, and that might help with estimation at certain points. So we've got 0, 2, 4, 5, and 8. So then we read from the beginning, and we see 4 fifths is how many times greater than 8 cubed. So we know that 4 fifths is translates to an equal sign. How many times greater? Well, I'm just going to represent that as x times my 8 to the third. Now, the first thing that we want to do when manipulating uncommon bases, meaning they're not the same base, we want to reduce to the least common base. And we know that in this case, both 4 and 8 can be rewritten as bases of 2. So I can rewrite 4 as 2 squared. And 2 squared is being raised to the fifth. And that is equal to x, which is being multiplied by 2 to the third, because that's 8, rewritten as a base of 2, raised to the third itself. So now I just have to combine my exponents. And if I'm raising a base to a new power, I've got to multiply the exponents to combine them. So 2 to the second to the fifth becomes 2 to the tenth. And that's equal to x times 2 to the 3rd raised to the 3rd, which is 2 to the ninth. So that means we then can just divide both sides by 2 to the ninth, and we discover that 2 is equal to x. So that means that our x is the number of times greater for the 5th was than 8 to the 3rd, and that is just 2 times. And that is choice b. Be careful not to put it back in the exponential notation, remembering that all I was setting up was x as the number of times greater, because I'm just multiplying the whole thing by x as an expression. So now let's go ahead and scroll on down and take a look at a sample data sufficiency problem. So here we're being asked for the very seemingly simple, is the square root of x less than the square root of y? And this, of course, is a yes-no data sufficiency, so we'll just box that off so we don't lose sight of what we're being asked for. And we don't know much. We don't even know if these are integers, if they're not integers. We do know that what we need is one inequality relating 
x to y. Or, sorry, the square root of x to the square root of y. Because we know that the square roots can be even positive and negative. So that's one thing to remember is that if we have, say, the square root of 36, that could be equal to either positive or negative 6. So be aware of positives and negatives when you start engaging with inequalities and, honestly, the equations when you're talking about exponents. So now, condition 1 says x itself is less than the square root of y. Okay, so I need to probably just plug in here to make this more easily evaluated because if I square things, then I start needing to get two different options. I don't want to do that, but I want to be efficient. So we know we could make this easy for ourselves and just pick perfect squares. So if x were to say equal, let's go with four. Well, now y could be equal to say 25 because x itself is less than 25. And is the square root of x less than the square root of y? In this case, we definitely have a yes, because the square root of 4 is 2, the square root of 25 is 5. So that's our yes answer. But we also need to consider how this might not be the case. So if we said x were equal to, let's go with 1 fourth. Well, if x is equal to 1 fourth, and let's say y is equal to 1 ninth, because the square root of y in this case would be equal to 1 third. And 1 fourth is still less than 1 third, but this time x itself is greater than y, and the square root of 1 fourth, so the square root of x, would be equal to 1 half. So this time around, x is actually greater, or the square root of x is actually greater than the square root of y, whereas before, the square root of x being 2 was less than the square root of y, which was 5. So now we've got a no outcome, and that alone allows us to eliminate condition 1 by itself as sufficient, which leaves us with our answer choices of b, c, or e. Now, condition 2 says that the square root of y is greater than zero. Okay, well, that tells me nothing about x. So this by itself is clearly not sufficient, and we can eliminate choice b. But when we consider our combo, well, let's just revisit the prior examples. And we see that the square root of y is greater than zero here in our no, and the square root of y is greater than zero here in our yes. And both yes and no are still allowed. So because both yes and no are still allowed, the combination isn't sufficient either, and our answer is choice E. So if you're dealing with square root values and squaring of values and data sufficiencies, you have to be very careful about the implications of negatives. But to do so, you can test different options thinking about when square roots get bigger and get smaller, because we remember that if you square a fraction, you're going to end up with a smaller value, because if I did one half times one half, I get one fourth. Whereas if I square a value greater than one, the square is going to be bigger. So consider the implications of positives and negatives, especially with data sufficiencies, to help yourself avoid the trap answers on the particularly difficult exponential and radical questions you might encounter, especially on a second harder half of the quantitative section than the executive assessment. So go ahead into the practice problems to try your own exponent and radical questions to improve at this honestly probably higher end difficulty concept for the executive assessment exam to get ready for your own official test.